Welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's really a great pleasure to have um, all of you here today trickling in. Uh, uh, it's pretty good, I think, 9.30 on a Friday, you have to admit. Um, and uh, I should note, though, that the event has been uh, kind of full in terms of re registration for, for weeks now. So hold on to your seats. Um, I think that this is really a wonderful recognition of the importance of Laura Kurgan's work, her teaching, and her research practice uh, that she has led through the Center for Spatial Research. Um, the Center for Spatial Research, or CSR, was founded soon after I became dean in 2014. So it, this conference is really marking a kind of moment. Uh, and it was created thanks to the Mellon Foundation and its Architecture, Urbanism, and Humanities Initiative. Already then, it was clear to me that this center and Laura's leadership would become not only essential to this school and to the field of architecture, but more importantly, that it would enable much needed bridges across the university, its disciplines and practices. Architects, more than they, architects draw more than they build, we like to say here at the school, and drawing things together, rendering visible the invisible relations that organize our lives, our social interactions, our movements, the making of our cities, and the ways of knowing, as the title of this conference suggests, has become an essential skill we can contribute as architects beyond our specific disciplinary expertise and to other disciplines, enabling new collaborations to produce new forms of knowledge, of practice, but also of critical engagement. And it's precisely this last possibility, the drawing together of both criticality and engagement, that renders the Center for Spatial Research contribution so important at this time. Neither taking data, technologies, and science for granted, uh, as new positivist and technocratic approaches are promising us brighter, smarter cities for the future, nor retracting into an illusory critical distance from those technologies, which we have become fully addressed by and embedded within, as Kurgan has said. The Center for Spatial Research is drawing new lines of inquiry and opening up new hybrid spaces for engaged scholarship and research, which are at once outside and inside, close up and at a distance, embedded and critical, bringing together architecture, data science, and the humanities to form new ways of knowing the spatial, social, political, and ethical dimensions of data technologies, their potential and consequences. Amongst the numerous interdisciplinary collaborations that, that the center has enabled already in a short time are the creation of an interactive map using historical census of New York City with Mayn Guy and Rebecca Cobrin from the history department, the collaboration with the Columbia Global Centers, uh, GSAP Studio X in Amman, and other cultural organizations in the Middle East to create a cultural initiative urban platform. The 2017 launch of the Brain Index, commissioned by the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute and designed in collaboration with Mark Hansen at their journalism school. And most recently, the launch this spring of Points Unknown, a series of collaborative workshops and courses that introduce mapping and data visualization to journalism students as investigative and storytelling tools. The center has also had great impact already on both GSAP and GSAS's curricula, integrating new interdisciplinary courses that have created bridges between the architecture school and many other schools here on campus. Future work will no doubt continue to in intensify uh, these uh, collaborations and uh, grow the network even beyond the university. Uh, many of you here are you know, coming from many other disciplines and practices, and it's really uh, sort of meaningful to have you all here at, at GSAP. Uh, and so on this note, I'd like to introduce uh, Laura Kurgan. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amal, for the generous introduction and in general for your support of the, of the center. Um, I'm going to repeat just a few things um, as well that Amal, that Amal said. So first, thank you all for being here. We're so excited that the, um, 
we're going to be in this conversation today. Um, and we're here thanks to the ambitious initiative of the Mellon Foundation in Architecture, Urbanism, and the Humanities, which is actually a consortium of more than a dozen universities committed to linking the essential but too often separate fields of inquiry. At Columbia, the foundation has helped establish us, the Center for Spatial Research, now in its third year. Um, thanks as well to Amal. It really, it couldn't have happen, happened without your support and your enthusiasm for this project, even just in hosting um, this event. Um, and thanks as well to my partners in the humanities, first Sharon Marcus and now Sarah Cole, for their essential work in making the humanistic side of the project actual rather than merely aspirational. Um, I'd like to take a moment to dedicate this day to Hilary Ballin, who was a senior advisor to this initiative and a longtime professor of art history at Columbia before she moved to N NYU. She shared my love and suspicion of maps and their usefulness in urban research. She was a generous force in helping us define the mission of the center. We miss her, and her spirit is with us today as well as uh, beyond this day. And I welcome Diane Harris, who is in the audience, already a friend of the Buell Center here at GSAP, who follows Hillary in heading up this initiative, and we're excited to be working with you in the future. So if you look at our website, um, what was, how do I go forward? No, yeah. Um, if you look at our website, you'll see that the work we present there is very similar in tone uh, to the work many people who are presenting today in this conference. So what is that tone? I can try summarize it this way. I received an email yesterday from someone regretting that she had not answered our invitation because she said all things relating to smart cities end up in her spam folder. <laughs> and I promise you she'll be here later today. Um, but this, I would say, is pretty much the opposite of a smart cities conference. Most of those people uh, think that they know what cities are, what it means to run them smartly. We are here to ask what are cities, where do they begin and end, who is allowed in and out of them, and how do we come to know them? How do they become the object of knowledge, but also the producers of that knowledge as well? Today, the generation and deployment of data is at the forefront of projects to reshape the cities for better or for worse. As a consequence, responding to urban change demands critical literacy in technology, and particularly data technologies. This conference addresses itself to the deep ambivalence of interventions in the urban as it explores the ways that knowledge regimes have impacted our built world. So we'll hear many viewpoints today, and I don't think it's too risky, though, to say that we have in common a commitment to both working with images, numbers, and with words, and doing that critically, as Amal has already pointed out. I, for one, am both mesmerized and suspicious of the tools and methods we deploy, as well as the images and maps we produce. So we write about them, contextualize them, expose their origins, algorithms, and biases. Although there's a lot of technology in the room and technical knowledge on the stage, we share a sense that the strategies and passions and rigors of the humanities are essential to work we want to do with and in our cities. The use and abuse of spatial data continues to grow and to challenge us as scholars and in our daily lives, from satellite navigation in cities to the news we read to our place-based neighborhoods and our communities in which, we involve, which involve multiple networks and spaces to complex military apparatuses and to su the surveillance of our borders. In fact, two people are not at this conference because of just that today. Um, so today, we have speakers who are artists, designers, architects, urban planners, anthropologists, African and African diaspora historians, experimental and human geographers, media theorists, historians, literary theorists, and more. When approaching urbanism, interdisciplinary work is inevitable. And in order to understand the set of questions we put forward in the prompt, we need this very type of group that is gathered here today. We are really looking forward to the SIG day and the exchanges, as well as discussing how all the panelists work will have an influence on our own in the next couple of years. So before I hand over to our really great group of speakers, um, I just want to uh, say something organizational about the day. 
This morning we have two panels and then Wendy Chun's keynotes and she's also brought some students with her. Where's Wendy? Hi, Wendy. Okay. Um, this afternoon we have three panels and then Trevor Paglin's keynote. He's at the back somewhere over there. Uh, keynote lecture and then a reception. There'll be a few breaks between panels which we'll announce and it is essential really essential today that we keep our schedule because we have the auditorium until a certain point. So uh, the link for the schedule is here and there's a handout, is there? And there's a handout um, as well, which uh, if you prefer paper and not looking at your cell phones all day, please use that. Um, so lastly, it really is really, I mean firstly, um, thank yous. So the first one goes to Dare Brawley. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. All the all the panelists already know her. She's done an amazing job of researching and organizing the day. Thank you. Um, thanks to Lila Cavalier. I don't know where she is. She's probably some there. She is at the back um, for her event organization. Since her arrival at Columbia, all events have started running on time. In fact, I tried to delay her this morning. She said no. <laughs> um, and today, so today will be no exception. Also, thanks to Paul Amitai and Stefan Bodeker for making sure the conference was really well publicized. We are so happy it's resulted in all of you being here today. Um, and thanks also to Richard Bay for um, this digital first graphic design and the uh, poster. He's uh, everybody, um, I don't know if he's here in the audience, but he might be later today. Um, and thanks to our students also who are helping all day with the reservation list amongst other things and also to Shannon Worley who you will notice during the day Instagramming and tweeting from the floor. If you want to join her, please use the hashtag at Knowing Cities. Thank you. Okay, and I'm also introducing my dear friend Felicity Scott who's going to moderate the first panel and Felicity and I have the habit of somehow replicating each other's <laughs> work. She always does the way, way prehistory of critical data, and I'm like always way in the present. <laughs> so. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so welcome uh, to the first panel, which I'm moderating, as uh, Laura mentioned. Um, we have three really fantastic speakers uh, in this panel, uh, pan Shannon Matten, who's right here, uh, Anita Se Chan, and Arit Halpern whose papers are going to trace out a type of broad temporal arc in the technical med uh, mediation of information or data concerning cities, um, uh, concerning, and I should say, operating within cities, information related to cities' design, to their inhabitants, to their function, to their forms of governance, their appearance, uh, their visibility, surveillance, etc., uh, as well as the forms of life cities support uh, or seek to prohibit or regulate Indeed, as Shannon's work reminds us, this nexus of media technical infrastructure and how we know or act upon cities is not in any sense new or unique uh, to recent decades, but has been embedded in and informed the epistemic and material conditions of the urban domain for millennia, if not always determining uh, the conditions in a direct manner. But what this nexus of technologies uh, and cities includes and looks like now, how it functions, who participates, who pays, and how we can even begin to recognize and conceive its role have changed considerably, as has its ethico-political valence. So Anita and Art's papers will in turn draw out a series of, of further aspects of this complicated and variegated intersection of, of cities and technologies as they have transformed uh, in somewhat more recent decades. So together, these papers will help us identify and unpack some of the historical and contemporary contours of this nexus, again, of media technical infrastructures uh, and the urban, uh, as well as some of the key questions at play, while also helping uh, to provide something like a platform uh, for a type of measure of what have changed and what has uh, persisted. So I'm going to very, very briefly introduce the speakers in the order of their presentations, after which I'll hand the podium over to them, uh, and then following their presentations, we'll convene at the table uh, for a conversation and to open it up to questions uh, from the audience. And um, uh, you can refer to the, the website for a little bit more detail about our speakers, should you, should you need that. So to begin, Shannon Matten is Associate Professor of Media Studies at the New School, uh, and her work um, is very much focused on architecture and urbanism. 
Her books include the new downtown library, uh, which involves Seattle, amongst other um, uh, projects known very well to this audience, Deep Mapping and the Media City, and Code and Clay, Data and Dirt, and she has a regular column uh, in the magazine Places, well known to uh, GSEP um, uh, audiences. So Anita Seychan is Associate Professor of Communications in the Department of Media and Cinema Studies at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and her work addresses information technologies in the context of globalization, uh, often with a Latin American focus. Her book is titled uh, Networking Peripheries, uh, Technology, uh, Technological Futures, and the Myth of, the digital, uh, of Digital Universalism. Art Halpern is Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Concordia University, a historian of science by training. Her research articulates complex connections between computing, cybernetics, data visualization, architecture, and design, uh, and her book is titled Beautiful Data. It's a beautiful title. Um, so, under the rubric then of this nexus of technology and cities, the panel is going to bring together uh, disciplinary expertise from a series of intersecting but distinct fields, media and communication studies, anthropology, the history of science, information science, art and design in different configurations. And so I just wanted to say it's a you know, variegated field of research and uh, one which I have been sort of struggling with or musing over uh, in recent months uh, while digging around in the UN archives and actually some other archives to recover um, the rather remarkable story uh, of, a, of a film apparatus, actually a film and sort of slide tape apparatus that the, that the UN seek to um, produced in the context of the Habitat Conference in Vancouver in 1976. And it was quite literally a, a project to sort of govern governments through what they considered new media, and argued that it was new media particularly for governance. Um, and, uh, and it was also just to, to, to point out a, a attempt to govern governments in the way they understood and, and regulated things like informal settlements following um, shifts in world bank policies in the early 1970s. So I'm really looking forward to this panel. Um, but right now, I'll hand it over to Shannon. So. so thank you very much. Um, it's truly an extraordinary lineup of speakers, so I want to thank, and it's an honor to be a part of it. So thanks very much to Laura for organizing, and to Dr. Dare. It's been an absolute delight to work with you. And Felicity, thanks so much for moderating the panel and for the nice introduction. OK, so we are living in many regards in exceptional times, yet little of it seems progressive. We have a petulant baby in the Oval Office. The Cold War has returned. Evils and neuroses long thought buried have resurfaced. Walls and moats, fists and firebombs are our diplomatic tools. Science is suspect. If anything, the last year has been a populist lesson in historiography. History certainly is not a unidirectional march toward progress. With so much hope lost on the national front and in the global community, many have invested in the city as a potential locus of progressive action. The sanctuary, the bulwark of sustainable practices, the place where mayors and municipal institutions can potentially make a difference. And they can do so thanks in part, ostensibly, to their embrace of efficient algorithmic governance, empirical data-driven endeavors, and empowering digital equity, civic tech, and open data initiatives. Yet in some cases, despite our broader historiographic reckonings, the proponents of these programs, particularly their corporate partners, practice a willful amnesia. Narratives of innovation and disruption depend upon convenient disregard for the past, or a marshalling of that past in a rewriting of history that positions their work, the corporation's work, as its apotheosis. Thus, our contemporary ways of knowing cities rely in part on deliberate, if perhaps subconscious, forms of unknowing or revisionism. But there's a rich material body of precedent to draw upon. As I argue, sorry for the promotion, self-promotion, as I argue in my new book, Cities, uh, uh, including many far afield from contemporary data hubs and research and development labs, embodied network smarts and forms of ambient intelligence well before we implanted sensors in the streets. Yesterday's cities, even our earliest settlements, were just as smart, even though theirs was an intelligence less computational and more material and environmental. For millennia, our cities have been designed to foster broadcasts, and I'm putting all these terms in, in scare quotes, they're kind of presentisms. They've been wired for transmission. They've hosted architectures for the production and distribution of various forms of intelligence, and served as hubs for record management. 
They've rendered themselves readable to humans and machines. And they've even written their source code, we might say, their operating instructions on their facades and into the urban form itself. They've coded themselves both for the administrative technologies or proto-algorithms that oversee their operation and for the people who have built and inhabit and maintain them. Acknowledging these histories is more than just a rarefied academic concern. There's more at stake here than historiography. To paraphrase the organizers, to paraphrase that is the organizers of today's conference, knowledge regimes have impacted the built world. And those knowledge regimes are often shaped, contained, preserved, and distributed through the prevailing technologies of their time. Technologies inform and are informed by urban epistemologies. And together, they're writ large in the material city. Again, to co-opt a phrase from Lara and Dara, an apt phrase from the conference organizers, technology mediates the ways that knowledge, power, and culture interact to create and transform the cities we live in. And we're not just talking about modern computational technology, as many media and urban and cultural historians have acknowledged. Archaeologists can also tell us a lot about the city's history as a mediated environment. And furthermore, they can expand our understanding of what has the potential to serve as a medium, or even what constitutes urban data. Archaeologists have found communicative potential in things like brick walls, stone structural elements, dirt mounds, bone, uh, bone tools, and even cities writ large. By examining how cities themselves have served as media and how they, they have been mediated across time, we'll see how media materialize in and through urban practices and processes, how they're the products of their urban environments and their human creators and users, and how those urban processes are agglomerations of various media, stones and bones, streets and circuits, plazas and people. I really like alliteration, you will see. So, so in my remaining time here, I'd invite you to join me in digging backward in time to examine how various historical, or what we might reductively call old, media forms have been given urban form, how their logics and politics and aesthetics have scaled up into the city. So let's start with some relatively recent technological resonances. Since the mid-19th century, many cities' atmospheres have been charged with electric and electromagnetic telecommunications, telegraph and telephone wires, and radio waves. New communication systems remade cities around themselves. They incited the erection of new towers and broadcast buildings, either grandiose structures shrouded in mythology or humble shacks, and they frequently darkened the streets with their rivers of wires. While the city offered up a vast listening public and consumer base for broadcasters and service providers, the material city also presented material barriers to their operation. Its skyscrapers were ideal perches for antennae, while they also impeded the signal's dissemination, that is. Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier imagined that these new technologies would transform urban morphology, allowing for greater decentralization. Yet many historians argue, suggest that those telecommunications technologies had both centripetal and centrifugal effects, concentrating businesses near the telecom exchange buildings where customers could quickly access financial data and avoid signal attenuation, while also allowing for the dispersion of manufacturing and shipping facilities. They also permitted company employees to settle out along the streetcar lines, where they were only a phone call away from the downtown business office. There's even some speculation that the phone made the skyscraper a functional place of business. Without a mediated means of communicating between floors, supposedly, we would have needed countless bays of elevators to shuttle messenger boys by uh, delivering memos between the floors. So many elevators, in fact, that they would have eaten up the entire floor plate, or most of it. Architectural historian Emily Bills argues that even Los Angeles, that sprawl so often attributed to cinema and cars, owes its morphology to the telephone, which she calls the first form of infrastructure to efficiently and effectively bind the greater Los Angeles area into a comprehensive multinucleated whole. While the early telephone networks organized a hub and spoke model, connected while the early telephone networks organized in a hub and spoke model, connected LA's downtown to its outlying agricultural areas, it didn't connect those agricultural communities to each other. And those farming communities and growers associations needed to share information with each other about weather, harvests, freight, and other business concerns. So they created their own phone lines, and communities grew around them. Farm-grown phone networks thus seeded, lots of agricultural puns here, LA's further de decentralized <coughs> development. 
We might say the telecommunications topology of derricks and switches and wires and exchanges reflected a market epistemology, a way of knowing and operationalizing the city to facilitate the dissemination and operationalization of business information and to satisfy new domestic and commercial telecom customers. Of course, this market-driven way of knowing the city certainly isn't new. The fact that the city has served as a mediated space of exchange of goods and services and information has long impacted its material form and its inhabitants' lives. New technologies exposed those inhabitants to new sensory experiences, new ways of listening in public, new ways of knowing their cities through sound. Brian Larkin, a Barnard and Columbia faculty member, writes about the arrival of colonial radio in the 1940s in Nigeria. Loudspeakers installed outside the Emirate Council Office in the public library, the post office, and other public places brought music and words uttered in British accents into and intended to win Nigerians over to, quote, the power and promise of modern life, end quote. For centuries in the Islamic world, the call to prayer and, more recently, recorded sermons have resounded, mixing with the urban din, providing a means of spiritual orientation for the faithful and particularly in spiritually diverse cultures, inciting debates over spatial and sound politics. After centuries of dispute over the heights of minarets and the position of the muezzin who issues the call, some cities, responding to complaints of noise pollution, have decreed that those calls be broadcast via radio rather than cast into the urban air. The urban infrastructures of telecom have proven themselves quite adaptable, retrofitable for an internet age and a terrain of connected devices. The new topologies of ethereal cellular telecommunications and arrays of connected things still rely on networks of wires and poles and other material, often metal, gadgets. Our bodies can flow through the streets with, quote, seemingly seamless coverage, never suffering a lost connection because of a Byzantine array of hardwired antennae bolted to rooftops and facades, knit together with millions of seams, beaming imperceptible but still very much material waves at all that populates the streets below. We inhabit a data space dat defined by various levels of intersecting protocols that direct our connections, facilitate or close off access, and thus subtly shaped the geographies, both informational and physical, that we are then able to explore. Amidst such indecipherable, proprietary, and even exploitative co-optations of the electromagnetic spectrum, we find some communities staking a claim to their own frequencies. While pirate radio was particularly prevalent in the 1960s, we see today, around the world, a resurgence of low-powered radio. Resolutely local stations, often committed to homegrown music and community news that, in conflict zones in particular, becomes a lifeline. Even those informal broadcasts still rely on the city as an infrastructure. As Matthew Fuller writes of London's tower blocks, quote, the thicker the forest of towers, the more antennae perched above the city, the more the radiant city, botched, radiates, end quote. In such botched cities, where so much of the world's population lives, pirate radio sounds out the disjunctive, mismatch, time slippage, grafting, and hacking that characterize urban survival. The city might be botched and broken up, as he describes it, but still, it resounds. Improvisatory resounding and listening constitute ways of knowing. Wired or unwired, concentrated or dispersed, smooth or striated, the media city resounds, as it has for millennia. So let's jump back a few decades, or sorry, a few millennia, much more than decades. Whereas today, some governing bodies find it more efficient and convenient to delegate the work of listening and decision making to the machine, allowing an algorithm to seemingly impartially churn through the ethical and moral dimensions of governance, such matters of computation were once matters of deliberation or decree. Cities have historically provided space, either deliberately or accidentally, for the verbal, verbal, that is, articulations of democracy or dictatorship, and the vocalizations and bodily performances of public demonstration. Through archaeoacoustics, we can understand how ancient Athens law courts, stoa, and auditoriums cultivated orators' delivery and their audiences' engagement. The geometry and materiality of different spaces engendered particular forms of deliberation, styles of delivery, and ways of knowing. Even the ideal city itself often called for a particular infrastructure for the exchange of information. Aristotle prescribed a city that would contain no more people than could hear a herald's voice. 
archaeologists and classicists in seeking to understand how the Roman Forum functioned acoustically as a space of speech and pageantry have acknowledged that their own ways of knowing these ancient cultures and the ancients' means of engaging with the content of a proclamation or eulogy relied on much more than the verbal script. These were multi-sensory affairs, and the forum and other spaces created a formal tableau that assigned status to different sensory experiences, the smells of bodies and food, the heat of the sun, the visual and textural cacophony of statuary and epigraphy that covered these public artworks and buildings. Despite both ancient and contemporary planners' attempts to create cities as spaces of formal and visual order and acoustic harmony, spaces known through reason and rationality, we also know our cities to be terrains of cacophony and at times productive chaos. Voices of demonstration and collective dissent have long punctuated urban soundscapes, transforming streets and squares into resonance chambers for protest, places where counter epistemologies are produced. The particular material properties of those urban gathering spaces and their codes of operation also inform how collectives form and how voices resound there. Sites of infrastructural convergence are symbolically rich, often reinforcing the political messages of the people <coughs> demonstrating there. But gatherings often also coalesce in underutilized, marginal spaces, terrains vague, as uh, Saskia Sassen argues, Threatened and otherwise invisible groups can become and present to themselves there and to others unlike them. Those invisible groups can also make their mark on the city in graphic form, through, of course, graffiti and, as I noted earlier, epigraphy. Jane Webster notes that individuals at all levels of Roman society, including slaves, made literary and non-linguistic figural inscriptions, both painted and carved on the city's surfaces. Such inscriptions have long served to codify architectural functions, proclaim power, mark territory, evoke beliefs, profess allegiances, direct ritual, announce laws, and identify those who are welcome and unwelcome. The Islamic world has a particularly rich epigraphic tradition. In a largely anaconic culture, that is one that forbids the creation of images of sentient beings, Yasser Tabas explains, Public inscriptions were by necessity one of the primary visual means of political and religious expression, and one of the few ways for a dynasty to distinguish its reign from that of its predecessors. The aesthetic properties of those public texts, their color, materiality, and form, have played a key role in how and what they communicate. These scripts function haptically rather than merely visually. For instance, as Taba explains, the floriated Kufic script, sometimes ornamented with gold and glass mosaic, was deliberately ambiguous. It was both boldly visible and incomprehensible, seemingly inclusive and transparent, but ultimately obfuscatory. This urban code was encrypted. Those Roman and Islamic inscriptions, an early form of urban markup, we might say, were often encoded on the humblest of geologic substrates. Many came to recognize over the past few years that their immaterial media are resolutely material, and that their virtuality and seeming artificiality are dependent upon natural geologic components, copper, coltan, tungsten, silicon. Urban history manifests this entanglement. Mud and its material analogs, clay, stone, and brick and concrete, have supplied the foundations for our human settlements and forms of symbolic communication, and have bound together our media, urban, architectural, and environmental <coughs> histories. Some of the first writing surfaces, clay and stone, were the same materials used to construct ancient city walls and buildings, whose facades also frequently served as substrates for written texts. The formal properties of those scripts, the shapes they took on their clay or parchment or paper foundations, were also in some cases reflected in urban form, how the city molded itself from the materials of the landscape. And this is from research of Brinkley Missick, who also teaches here at Columbia. And those written uh, documents have always been central to cities' operation, their trade, accountancy, governance, and culture. Think of all the other print-based forms of urban media that embody urban epistemologies and program the material city, newspapers and their architectural columns, filing cabinets, and the enormous file of the skyscraper itself, early architectural treatises and their prescription of particular repeatable spatial forms, legible building facades and urban forms, and libraries full of books. These media represent entire chapters of technological and urban history that we simply don't have time to explore here, but they too profoundly impact the way cities are designed, built, administered, experienced, and understood. 
We've been predicting a paperless era for decades, but there's still, but print is still here. Independent bookstores are experiencing a renaissance, our cities host vibrant niche publishing cultures, and the exchange and display of print material in public spaces affords many urban dwellers a means of carving out a commons amidst increasing corporatization and platformization. Media technologies, both old and new, analog and digital, have, to quote again the conference organizers, mediated the ways that knowledge, power, and culture intersect or interact to create and transform the cities we live in. And even as we focus on the digital and data-driven, it's important to recognize that these are data too. That the old and analog are still present and active. They are, as Raymond Williams explains, residual, formed in the past but still active in the cultural process, not only and often not at all as an element of the past, but as an effective element of the present. We're still talking and listening and reading and writing and printing and filing. <laughs> Our cities past and present mediate between various manifestations of intelligence, legal codes and copper cables, inscriptions and imaginaries, algorithms and acoustics, public proclamations and system protocols. They're both old and new, code and clay. A city that knows its dependence on both ether and ore is better equipped to accommodate temporal entanglement and epistemological plurality a more capacious, historically attuned ways of knowing our cities and of generating and operationalizing urban intelligences produces cities that are ultimately much smarter, or we might say wiser, than the sum of their intelligent parts. So, thank you. Kurgan uh, and to Dare and uh, to Felicity as well for the lovely introduction. Um, so just to begin, how does the internet come to know you? I want to suggest that interrogating this apparently simple question is central to the matter of studying the means and ways of knowing cities being developed today. Or more precisely, the promise of how network environments are being reimagined as intelligent sensing spaces has as much to do with how cities can be remade into intelligent and self-ordering infrastructures as how the everyday urban actor can newly emerge, too, as a knowing navigator. One who now empowered with data channels and information feedback loops comes to sense self and city distinctly, managing an ever-mutating complex of urban systems spanning transportation, utilities, the security, and economy that can at last be revealed, even if only momentarily, as verifiably useful and reliable manifestations of urban form. Without a doubt, algorithmic infrastructures have played central roles in this shift. A media theorist, Wendy Chun, has underscored as much in writing about the relationship of code to crisis events and the increasing reliance on computational code as the privileged means to temporarily anticipate and avoid crisis, to automate, in other words, an enforcement of safe living. As she writes, quote, if voluntary actions once grounded certain norms, now technically enforced settings and algorithms do, from software keys designed to prevent unauthorized copying to iPhone updates that disable unlock iPhones, that disable unlock, disable unlock iPhones, and from GPS tracking devices to proxies used to restrict search engine results. Today, moreover, she writes, quote, software codes not only save the future by restricting user action, they also do so by drawing on saved data and analysis. They thus seek to free us from danger by reducing the future to the past, that is, to a past anticipation of the future, end quote. The temporal work involved in knowing users today in efforts to avert crisis, whether self or externally sourced, has not been minor. And indeed, as privacy right groups have observed, this has involved the plumbing of users' data trails and analysis of social networks, tracking of life events, minor or major or alike, and a correlation of platform activities to identify patterns, alert for potential emergencies, and as Chun writes, quote, to cut through the constant stream of information to differentiate the temporarily valuable from the mundane. 
and to offer users a taste of real-time responsibility and empowerment, end quote. Cities, however, also reveal a parallel dimension to the temporal work of coded ecologies, demonstrating how network environments have not only reordered the experience of time, event, and crisis, but have also redefined spatial orientation, refiltered geography and the experience of co-location, and transformed the condition of feeling lost or even simply being out of, simply feeling left out of place. One doesn't need to be in South Korea's Incheon in the depths of Silicon Valley or in the heart of self-driving car-enabled <laughs> zones, discrete sites that prototype aspirational smart city functions, to have an interface that reminds you how you never have to feel lost, <coughs> abandoned, or delinked from what could be relevant proximate sites of valued objects for you again. Google announced just this when it launched a new version of its Google Maps application and pronounced the end of the era of single standardizable maps and the beginning of the age of the endlessly responsive, personalizable, and adaptive geolocation. As a company enthused, quote, what if we told you that during your lifetime, Google could create millions of custom maps, each one just for you? In the past, a map was just a map. What if instead you had a map that's unique to you, always adapting to the task you want to perform right at this minute, mapping experience that helps you find places, including places you never would have thought to look for, end quote. Not unlike PageRank, Google's online search algorithm that's dominated the market by taking some 200 signal inputs from individual users, everything from where you're logged in to what browser you use to what you search for and expressed interest in before, Google Maps could now determine who you are, predict your navigation needs, what kinds of sites you'd like and should attend to, and so too, determine which ones you wouldn't, those that should be deprivileged, avoided, hidden, or removed from your navigation stream altogether. Google CEO Eric Schmidt professed back then that it, was, it, was, it got closer to the kind of product experience he believed users were looking for, for a Google that can, quote, tell them what they should be doing next, end quote. Such forms of information manipulation, redoctoring, and the explicit omission of data as a means of suppressing difference and excluding sites of potential conflict with the projected tastes and profiles of individual users troubled other internet actors. Upworthy founder Eli Pariser famously warned such functions would amplify what he observed to be the quietly polarizing and stratifying effects of filter bubbles, or what he termed to be the re-engineered information ecologies explicitly designed to keep a user locked inside and occupied by their own interests, spaces that function as a form of, quote, invisible propaganda, indoctrinating us with our own ideas, amplifying our desire for things that are familiar, and leaving us oblivious, he said, to the territory of the unknown, unquote. The recent series of na national election upsets grip gripping Western democracies now with the specter of fake news, disinformation campaigns, computational propaganda, and the supposedly surprise rise of extreme right parties have turned filter bubbles more recently into objects of global debate. Alongside have been new questions on the effects of big data and whether the explosion of limitless data streams that were promised to bring us closer to a total indexing and supposed interconnecting of reality necessarily work to amplify the value of critical co code signals, inf critical information signals, or whether they instead remade signal into a new form of attention demanding noise, a form that could be used to bury and silent signs of other realities for users including ones that might have defied the soothing comfort of ready-made explanations and the already known preconceptions of the self-empowered navigator. Publicly, social media sites and companies have started to acknowledge the effects of filter bubbles. Mark Zuckerberg's humanitarian manifesto was released not long after Google announced its application of a new feature snippets function in Google as new fact-based content to recalibrate page ranks custom, custom returns. But while industry giants continue to insist on necessarily play key roles as part of the solution to growing evidence of social polarization, their continued self-references and projections in the case of Facebook, for instance, of acting in the interest of a presumed shared global community so that, quote, our community can have the greatest positive impact on the world, end quote, makes one question whether such companies are able to move beyond a certain key conceit the one in which they presume they already represent the force best positioned to bring the greatest positive impact on the world. It begs qu the question that is, if they too are able to move beyond their own deeply built and reinforced filter bubbles, and might instead be able to imagine worlds where varied unknowns, unpredicted but embodied others, and not their own platforms, might instead serve as central connective forces, 
and alternative and creative uh, reworldings. So for this next section, I, I wanted to uh, open with a scene from one data-driven startup in Lima, Peru, the Code Academy Laboratoria, that's been celebrated particularly within global tech sectors for transforming professional classes and rapidly retraining women from at-risk zones in Latin America and cities for employment into employment-ready coders in just six months. Code Academies like it began making a flurry of headlines less than a decade ago for responding to the reported global crisis of a shortage of coders. Central to this was demonstrating the apparent market viability too of, among other things, creating accelerated ventures to teach programming in a fraction of the standard time university degrees normally require, sometimes in as little as two or three months. At a recent graduation ceremony in Lima from one of Laboratory's latest cohorts, the motto of the company on the power of code to transform both individual students and urban ecologies alike is palpably channeled throughout. The event, hosted in a packed auditorium in the manicured tourist district of Miraflores, opened with a familiar triumphant soundtrack from Star Wars, <laughs> with text flashing on the screen of how, in a galaxy far, far away, the students of Laboratoria were called upon to transform code work. It was followed by a virtualized three-minute video of a morphing network graph representing the class's collective activity in their shared GitHub repository a code-based archive representing all the students' lesson work and code commits over the course of the boot camp. The video represented, in other words, six months of collected student activity compressed into a three-minute network visual. The first minute steady whirls of movements mesmerized the audience, making up large, made up largely of students' family members hailing from neighborhood, neighborhoods hours, and in some cases, days, worth of travel away from Miraflores' upper middle class district. In the final seconds, the graph suddenly burst into an explosion of rapid whirls that represented the two hackathon events organized for students to work with actors from Laboratoria's network of over 400 regional corporate companies. The students' back-to-back -back -back all-nighters, hackathons, that is, events of intensified on-site competition with the potential of earning employment now memorably came back to life for students in the flurry of data streams rapidly stretching and looping out before them. Alongside larger industry actors, data-driven startups like Laboratoire have worked then to prototype the presumed proximate future of ubiquitously connected environments that now, empowered with new tools of data analytics and prediction systems, can work to optimize results in the artificially compressed space of the urban boot camp. And while Laboratoire's work turns on reputed capacities for managing thousands of user profiles, to weed out thousands of applicants per cohort and mine information pools for key signals, that best ID viable talent and enable the company to rapidly and even automatically respond to individual learners' needs. The company has also been touted for being more than a typical code academy and for being a startup that's worked to know applicants and in fact the city ecologies where they're based differently. This because since its founding in Lima, Peru, five years ago, all the students have been young women hailing from economically challenged sectors of Lima. The, in Lima, the first city where the company set up offices, this means students are typically first-generation degree earners, hailing from the city's most peripheral districts and pueblos jóvenes, or new settlement zones, where new families migrating from the Andes and remote jungle regions often begin to settle. For such learners, two-hour-long commutes to classes in a single direction and paths that weave across Lima's variated traffic and vast zones of cultural and economic divide are routine and they are only among the, f the first among many layered complexities Laboratoria students are required to manage as their own routines of knowing the city on a daily basis in order to invest in and train for their futures. Mariana Costa Checa, Laboratoria's 29-year-old co-founder, neatly sums up its work to in redefining the city in another way, saying, quote, what we try to do is go out and find talent where nobody else is looking for it. So we try to identify young women who haven't been able to access quality education or job opportunities because of economic limitations and train them to become the most awesome web developers they can be and then connect them with employment opportunities in the tech sector, end quote. Such work of filtering out talent and the undertapped potential for success in the city is key to what's made Laboratoria a darling in the world of social enterprise today, earning it in its short five-year existence, multiple international awards in tech and development, including the 2014 Cunan Prize, the 2016 Google Rise Award, 
We've also run one multi-million dollar backing from venture capital sources from Telefonica to Google. And notably, they earned a $2 million Inter-American Development Bank investment to support the growth of new projects in Chile, Mexico, uh, and other areas in Peru. Last year, they also gained prominent global visibility as one of only three awardees distinguished at the Global Enterprise Entrepreneurship Summit, an annual conference hosted by the White House and moderated that year by Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg and then US President Barack Obama. All this has additionally accelerated the expansion of laboratory startup sites and mounted pressure for faster intake, decision making, and responsiveness within each site to heighten success rates. Having begun in, in Lima just five years ago, the company expanded to three new cities, Mexico City, Santiago, and Arequipa, Peru, and is now slated to open three more offices in Bogota, Colombia, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Guadalajara, Mexico, for a total of seven sites with the objective being to expand to some 10,000 graduates per year across the network. This means that it will have to grow graduation rates exponentially 20 times over by the year 2020. At this rate of frenzy's growth, it's, growth, it's hard to believe that the company began just a few short years ago as a project among four friends, half of them graduates from the same elite master's program in the US Ivy League University who first trained a class of just 12 women coders at the beginning. But last summer, in Laboratoria's classroom, a converted floor of a high-rise office building in Middle Flores, Ermin Marin, one of the charismatic co-founders, speaks to the cohort of 50 students without any hint of concern of the bright futures they'll face. Even if he may no longer know the names of any of them individually, he can wax nostalgic and channel his own early experiences in tech, assuring the class great things were soon to be in store for them. Quote, there are thousands of things that are going to happen in your lives, from meeting super cool people, to being able to travel, to definitely having opportunities to learn even more than you've come to learn here. And above all, of being able to have control to define your future." End quote. Maureen, however, also underscores what appears to be one key shift in the age of big data on the importance of making the right choices for themselves in managing space and time alike. Data-driven conduct, after all, channels new possibilities of micro-attentivity to the constant feedback loops and an experience of self as now embedded within fluid, interactive spaces, even when the self is offline. Here's Marin, for instance, coaching students on the importance of their choices on using time and space. Quote, it's a fact that a person takes about 26 minutes to recover when there's an interruption in work. It's a huge problem because imagine if you're interrupted three or four times. We're talking about an hour or two hours of work that's lost and productivity that you fail to develop. And obviously there are ways to limit that, to learn to manage my time well and organize my workspace." End quote. Marin's comments underscore how one's consciousness of time and space can get parsed and micro-segmented to the tempo of local decisions, data points, and moments and sites of potentially impactful action. Where products of good decision making might once have required months to identify, under logics of data conduct now, it seems, even a minute can be used badly. As Marin advises, self-organization start, should start, quote, before starting your workday, or maybe even the night before, when you have the opportunity to quickly check emails, since there are already people and things that are happening without you, and you don't want them to have to depend on your being there to continue, end quote. But it's his next tip that I find most unexpected. As he reminds students, quote, another important strategy is to use commute time and to go from home to work in a more productive way. And there are a lot of things that can be done, like trying to use that space to be able to have meetings, since today, a lot of jobs work remote remotely. So you can have meetings on the phone or use your phone for other digital conferencing that you could do during the commute. For many of us, commute times are long, right? More than an hour. So that's time that can be used to accomplish things for work and not wait until you get there. It's just a matter of organizing, end quote. For all laboratories celebrated data management and for all of Marin's own micro attention to time and space down to the optimal use of each minute and optimized use of even small micro spaces, Marin seems to have entirely lost sight of a larger picture. He misses, in fact, what even the most novice first time visitors to Lima or even just a Google image search might notice that the micro-owned public buses that the city is infamous for, and which are the most common popular forms of transportation used by the vast majority of Limenians to traverse the city, would be almost inconceivable spaces for workplace activity in almost any form. When Laboratoria students reference their typical commute of two hours, this consists of two hours of standing, 
with one hand gripping a handrail for balance and the other gripping a bag of possessions in the other. Bodies of travelers are pressed together side by side and most commuters require an exchange between multiple bus routes, so there's almost never a still uninterrupted stretch of time. And even if a free seat by miracle were to be encountered to imagine the possibility of a hands-free experience, the cacophony of rush hour traffic, a mix of horns, motors, and the insistent haulers of Gombe drivers sparking out routes would drown out any conversation. Marin's own commute to work consists of a 15-minute walk through the picturesque upper middle class neighborhood of Miraflores to Laboratorio's office space. But I can't help but wonder, for as much personal coaching and data collection on students at laboratory as Laboratorio dedicates to get to know its coders better, if the blindness to even the basic complexities of life for Laboratorio students isn't something that itself is pre-designed. Could it be that the company's message in the, of the power of individual training, empowered by access to the right information and choices around technology, can only be sustained so long as it can keep attention away from the real and varied local complexities that differentially shape the lives and daily work experiences of their students? So long, in other words, as it can manage its own management of time and attention across space and keep too much care from accruing around the lives and diverse lived experiences of individual students who enter their classroom. I obviously don't mean to answer that uh, in the last in a minute I have here. By means of closing, I do want to underscore how powerfully an unsullied narrative of transformation through code can operate and how much it can be used to speak in the interests of the future of city and user alike, at least as much as the work of connecting environments to self-manage internal systems as a privileged means and measure of the knowing city then is perhaps the work done at once to discount and filter out information pools, to unknow and omit awareness of key aspects of human experience, but here now virtuously pursued as necessary and even indispensable means of managing the urgent demands of scale, space, and speed. Thanks. Um, well, thank you, Laura and Dare um, and uh, Felicity for the beautiful intro. So um, I'm going to go really fast as usual. And uh, also, um, uh, probably this is more about not knowing than knowing a whole lot, but I'm really interested in uncertainty and, and the forms of kind of the epistemologies of, um, of speculation that are currently kind of transforming environments. So I'll just get going. Um, and people can also ask me because I'm working at a lot of the sites that I'm showing you, but I'm not going to necessarily talk about them. So um, from the tailings of large open pit mines to the omnipresent data centers with their seeming infinitude of data to the overconcentration of capital in the hands of the few, we appear to be in an age of dense accumulation, filling the weight of what once seemed so light. The internet and information, as all the speakers coming before me, have become concrete, literally utilizing the sand and material metals of our earth to transmit data in a manner not so different than constructing roads and buildings. So much weight makes us dream of being plastic, light, mobile, modulatory, capable of bearing these materialities while continuing to sustain the technical and economic fantasies of eternal growth and novel change. It's perhaps a little surprise then that since the 1970s, it is the word resilience, and here's a bunch of uh, population derivation curves from a famous um, article by C.S. Holling that kind of really introduced resilience into um, eco-environmental management. Um, this has become the figure of hope for planners, entrepreneurs, policy makers, and environmentalists alike. Resilience is a system's ability to absorb shock and continue functioning. The 1970s also marked the rise of another myth reality, that of finance, capital, and derivation. The derivative pricing equation has a lot of nature in it. It's basically a random walk. Uh, overimposed with a normal curve, and that's supposed to be, those are supposed to be little bouncing bubbles, but for some reason today it's not bouncing. Um, uh, and actually, one of the interesting things about this talk is you can see a lot of like little equations and funky, really badly made graphics, which you all could help me with. Um, but actually, part of it hints to a, to a representational problem, and I'm actually not sure how you actually show 
um, some of these phenomena and, and, uh, and even what it would mean to visualize or sense encounter with some of these infrastructures. Um, so uh, this uh, equation basically allows you to adjust time to bet on uncertainty so that you can basically make bet at randomly organized times and set arbitrary prices without actually ever having to know what actually happens to the underlying um, security. So finance is often presumed to be feather light and mobile and attached to earthly matters, while financial instruments are often argued to be detached from social and material processes they make commodities, they're understood as money making more money. As the recent 2008 crisis demonstrated, nothing could be further from the truth. Derivatives are financial instruments that allow a certain amount of something, mortgages, furniture, whatever, to be traded at some point in the future on agreed upon price. One can also, for example, also bet on the cancellation of an order or some other event changing the future price of the underlying commodity or security and so forth. The result is, is that the size of the derivatives market far overshadows the actual world's gross domestic product by now exceeding the world's GDP by 20 times. These markets have grown exponentially by 25% over the last, uh, per year over the last 25 years. So they're the largest economy on earth. What then is the relationship between speculation and resilience and extraction? How might we think together the seeming incommensurability of the material weight and geological timeliness of our earthly actions with the speed and mobility of globalized computational and machine-traded capital? And what does knowing even mean in a world of machine-traded data um, ungrounded in representing any final endpoint or in representation perhaps at all. These questions emerged for me quite viscerally in the course of doing field work on the topic of logistics in smart cities. Anyone who knows me knows Songdo uh, and has seen this picture. Um, I became concerned with the forms of speculation and hope that continue to facilitate the ongoing penetration of computation, both in terms of smart cities um, and grids, logistical systems, uh, mining, I've been hanging out at these gold mines in Malartic. They're also smart, you might be surprised to hear about, and of course, smart finance. And what's interested me in going to all these places that are all so smart is how we're being pessimistically computationally optimistic. So just to offer a little case study, uh, here's the marketing for Songdo, pretty cliche standard stuff. Uh, so on one hand, we have um, the unspoken admission, right, of an environmental or ecological disaster, some sort of crisis that's coming in terms of environmentalism. So all this ubiquitous computing is going to be green, it's going to be sustainable, it's going to be resilient. And that um, greenness is accompanied with a kind of faith of unending um, financial and economic growth. Um, so we've ended up with this kind of strange little equation, and part of my method is, is I make up all these funny use, uh, equations, but they're parts of trying to just think about um, how to map out these phenomena that are operating together, where we have bandwidth as in rates of bits transmitted, usually over some fiber optic cable, equals resilience has come to equal life itself. And in fact, there's another few set of little equations that I've sort of invented and I'm gonna talk about today, which is how has extraction in all its many derivative forms, including mining, uh, plus resilience, usually equated with smartness, um, plus a bit of speculation come to equal hopefulness. The end of the world has never looked better or more profitable. Um, and so uh, this is this phenomenon I'm kind of calling resilient hope, and I'm actually quite desperately concerned with both how to map and, and also intervene in it in its forms of violence. Um, so, uh, so Essentially, one of the other things that interests me, though, in this endless hopefulness is the way that the end never seems to arrive. So despite the admission of global warming and all these crises, um, there doesn't actually, when asked about um, cities like Songdo, uh, that are supposedly, uh, that are actually grafted out of the South China Sea and are like under sea level and are financially not like not, weren't doing very well at the time. When people ask like, so if this fails, uh, the engineers at Cisco, um, as well as the developers at Gale would say it's just a testing ground, an experiment, experimental, repeatable prototype. In fact, version 2.0 is already being rolled out in Malaysia and Ecuador. Um, and one of the things that has come to interest me is how this concept of testbed and time management mirrors the forms of derivation that are incorporated into uh, things like the Black Skulls derivative pricing equation. Um, so that I'm trying to get this to I want I want 
Okay. Uh, so <laughs> for whatever reason, the bounce, they won't bounce. Um, uh, but anyway, the, upon this, the volatility, how these forms of derivation and betting kind of mirror um, our forms of design. So we swap, derive, and circulate while we demo, prototype, and version in our design and architecture fields. And in the course of this talk, I'm going to talk about three operations that I think underpin this um, resilient hopefulness that marries this sort of process of swapping and deriving that mirrors the architectural and design processes that we go, which are hoping, demoing, and deriving. And so um, I'm going to start. So in order to do this, I'm going to talk about two case studies from my work, one from India um, in Kolkata in Shilaguri, and the uh, and Kolkata and the, and the West Bengal foothills of the Himalayas, and one from New York City that you're all quite familiar with, but I like to show things people know. Um, uh, so while seemingly desperate, I think thinking through them will help us think through some of this condition and what's at stake in it. So in March of 2016, I went to West Bengal to investigate both urban development in Kolkata and how Chinese capital is reformulating territory. Um, and for some reason, nothing is uh, OK. Oh. <coughs> Whoops. Um, and what you're seeing here is um, a scene of actually bouldering uh, at the base, in Shilaguri at the base, um, of it's in the Himalayan floodplains where people are basically uh, removing and extracting um, rock and sand for uh, concrete. Um, some 500 kilometers south is the uh, city of Rajarat in Kolkata, which you're seeing here. It was supposedly going to be designated as a smart city um, but it never finally got the designation. And in fact, most of the infrastructure is not, it was never completed. Like there's no water hookups, there's, um, it's not even clear that the, the fiber optic and the telecom infrastructure has been uh, hooked in. However, um, None of this really matters because all of it is heavily leveraged and credit debt swapped and most of it is being bought over by foreign investment and kind of flipped over. The result of this um, development, even though much of it's empty, is however the dispossession of some 30,000 people end up in these informal settlements or under working under deplorable conditions at the Kolkata port. Uh, and of course, in order to construct these complexes demands a whole lot of concrete, which continues to drive um, the annihilation, basically, of the Himalayan floodplains, at which point the rivers are basically sinking. And this is uh, threatening the entire um, river system of the Ganga uh, throughout um, India and Bangladesh. So I'm trying to think about this form of speculation in relation to scenes of ever, ever greater hopefulness. Um, so mirroring these scenes of graphic territorial scale violence are another set of marketing technological and logistical endeavors <coughs> that take part in a positive speculation on precarity and environmental destruction. So speaking of liquidity and rising waters in particular, let's recall the recent economic crisis of 2008, I guess not so recent any longer. Um, and not long after, one of the more astounding demonstrations of hopeful speculation focused on the future devastation of New York City, the rising currents exhibit at New York's um, Museum of Modern Art took place, uh, incidentally moments before the real Hurricane Sandy hits. Um, one of the most popular projects exhibited was Oyster Texture by Karl Orff, which I believe is now actually being implemented um, off of Staten Island. Um, the project uh, basically envisioned recruiting oysters, uh, oyster beds as sort of nature against nature, nature with lots of um, little scare quotes here, um, to kind of defend the city uh, against um, these rising waters as well as perhaps to, to clean the water. Um, the very recruitment of R and other organisms' body for and as infrastructure poses historically situated questions about what makes this new mode of managing speculation populations and futurity novel and how these forms of speculation are related to the discourse of resilience, in this case, making Manhattan resilient to climate change. The irony, of course, is that in serving these infrastructures, the oysters slowly die off as a result of their dirty and unhospitable environments, and this is even actually by design. Um, and right now, the oysters in general are being threatened simply due to rising water acidity, due to um, 
CO2 and changes in temperature. So the state of being used to death perhaps even goes beyond the terms often invoked um, to critique neoliberalism, such as extraction and subsumption. I'm trying to think about that. This death, however, is beautifully rendered. So what I'm concerned with is not the quality of the project, which actually could be very, very good, but actually the aesthetics that are accompanying this sort of um, envisioning of this negative future. Um, and in fact, this, uh, this, this future is being most definitely, uh, hopefully, speculated. The opening statements of the actual um, uh, contemporary arts of the catalog um, are actually bountifully optimistic. So MoMA and PS1 uh, joined forces to address one of the most urgent challenges facing the nation's largest city, sea level rise resulting from global climate change. Though the national debate on infrastructure is currently focused on shovel-ready projects that will stimulate the economy, we now have an important opportunity to foster new research and fresh thinking about the use of New York City's harbor and coastline, and as in past economic recessions, Construction has slowed dramatically, and much of the city's remarkable pool of architectural talent is available to focus on innovation, which is to say they're unemployed. <laughs> I love that. Um, anyway. um, in another project that is being shown behind me in the same exhibit, New Aqueous City by N Architects, repeats this theme of destruction made visible and aesthetically pleasing with the proposal for new zoning strategies and the literal use of bottom-up design strategies, such as placing flotation devices on the bottom of buildings and seawalls. The video depicts a storm surge and narrates by way of architectural intervention our survival. As the waters rise, new real estate and agricultural opportunities are offered. When the big storm finally hits, we see individuals, this is great. Here comes the surge. We're growing nice things. Everything's wonderful, and people calmly get on top and get airlifted out. And there isn't even any wind. It's amazing. Um, anyway, um, it all looks rather pleasant. However, in, in and there's indeed a, a fetish for these ruins. But I, I have to say, in, you know, in lieu of um, both the historical traces of things like Katrina and New Orleans, um, as well as the current situations in Houston and Puerto Rico uh, and much of the world, one can't help but ask who's being left behind, right, um, under these conditions. So the issue is not per se that some of these architecture and design projects aren't great, but it's a question about visualization and the, actually the encounter with what should be a devastating event, right? Um, this brings me to this question. So we have this combined sort of um, lust for ruins, if we will. Here's a Tate modern example of how much we like it in a nice in Detroit. Um, uh, with um, the emergence of resilience. So what ties these two things together, this Manhattan scene and this Calcutta scene, um, on the one hand is finance, obviously, but on the other hand there's a notion of ecology and environment that substantiates these ideas, a concept that we can joy th destroy things in the present and withstand the pain. So resilience has a particular logic. It's not about a future that is better, but rather about an ecology that can absorb constant shocks while maintaining its functionality and organization here. It speaks to Anita's work and probably and hopefully um, Wendy's talk later. So in following the work of Bruce Braun and Stephanie Wakefield, it is a state of permanent management without ideas of progress, change, or improvement. I'm interested in how it's married to certain forms of speculation. And both of these are technologies, right, of managing time in a very particular way. The irony, of course, as I already mentioned, is that all this hopelessness and crisis is actually met with this, this kind of hopeful speculation. Um, usually through new forms of temporal management in finance and technology. So real estate uh, speculation can continue to occur on new silk roads and never occupied smart developments, even as the Himalayan floodplains are destroyed, because in theory the end never arrives, but is simply delayed or more appropriately derived. So d resilience plays an important point uh, a thing in many fields. The understanding of resilience that is most crucial to my discussion today and to large-scale planning projects and contemporary discourse was first forced in ecology during the 1970s, especially in the work of C.S. Holling, who established a key distinction between stability and resilience. So the key thing is in his new formulation, stability does not equal resilience. This breaks from previous kind of cybernetic understandings of environment as homeostatic or, or maintaining equilibrium. Working from a systems perspective and interested in the questions of how humans could best manage elements of ecosystems um, that were of commercial interest, such as salmon, wood, etc., Holling developed the concept of resilience to contest the premise that ecosystems were most healthy when they returned quickly to an equilibrium state after being disturbed. 
He called this return to a state of equilibrium stability, but argued that stable systems were actually often unable to compensate for significant and swift environmental changes, and that, in fact, most systems in nature are not stable. They're not, they are not equilibrium oriented. As Hollings put it, and I quote, the stability view of ecosystem management emphasizes equilibrium, the maintenance of a predictable world. So one of the questions here is a new form, a new epistemology of not knowing of non-prediction and the harvesting of nature's excess production with as little fluctuation as possible. In short, Holling argued that stability was often the inverse of resilience. Resilient systems might have multiple states and could change while maintaining vital processes, just like our little random molecules that one day will <laughs> we'll move. Um, but uh, um, instead of worrying about preserving individual animals or lives, then resilience oper uh, managers should concentrate on preserving vital processes. So the focus moves away from preserving lives or individual numbers to preserving processes. Um, furthermore, a fact now clear when you look at strategies to um, preserve vital system security, for example. So resilience comes to mean not necessarily the preservation of individual lives, but the preser preservation of operations and processes. So resilience equals operability and liquidity, a lot of change and a lot of circulation. Perhaps this is nowhere best evoked than in um, Manhattan. This is Manhattan during the real Hurricane Sandy <laughs> Does everyone know what that one gleaming building is? Goldman Sachs. Uh, someone did their resilience planning. So the system might go down, but the vital processes are, are operating, unfortunately. So what's really key for us, though, is there's also a question of knowledge. This is a new epistemology of ignorance. Um, the concept of resilience is enabled by man a management pr approach to ecosystems that would uh, flow, would, as he said, flowing for this would be this is Holling's words, not the presumption of sufficient knowledge, but the recognition <coughs> of ignorance, not the assumption that future events are expected, but that they will be unexpected. So we have a new, and perhaps Donald Rumsfeld put it best, there are known unknowns, there are, known unknown, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknowns unknowns, and today we just don't know. Um, and ignorance has become a virtue to be instated within our, man, our, our, environment, our concepts of environment and finance and economy. So, um, so contemporary planning and finance, of course, take these little random things as, as, a, um, as an all-purpose epistemology and value. These fields posit resilience as a general strategy for managing uncertainty without endpoint while presuming our world is so complex and unexpected that events are indeed the norm. Um, and of course, this also signifies the collapse between emergence and emergency. These financial instruments and random walks bet on right volatility in and of itself as a virtue and as a fact. Um, so in this sense, the term operates in, just in the interest of producing a world where any change can be technically managed and assimilated while maintaining the ongoing survival of the system even at the cost of its particular components, be they individuals, ecosystems, or species coming back to our example of Goldman Sachs, which is perfect. So this is operation one. So we have hoping, we have resilience, and now we have demoing. How do we manage these temporalities in a way that that end just never seems to show up so we can keep betting on it? Such logics, as I mentioned, pervade the landscape of large-scale computational environments. And of course, there's a close link to computing here. So returning to the initial example of the imagined, never realized high bandwidth smart city of Songdo, um, every present state of the smart city is understood as a demo or prototype of a future smart city. Every operation is understood in terms of testing and updating a testing ground, an example, an experimental prototype, repeatable. As a consequence, there's never a finished product, but rather infinitely replicatable, yet always preliminary versions of these cities around the globe that can infinitely basically like never fail because they're never realized and they never really, they're sort of uh, in the sub space. This idea of the infrastructure's demo avoids any actual questions of whether the ins this construction impacts the planet, labor, or its inhabitants, and opens the door to assimilate any difficulty or challenge into the next version by way of deferral and derivation. This design logic allows the management and negotiation of risks through swapping, driving, and circulating um, from an imagined origin in a manner that avoids, as I said, ever having to finally take account or take responsibility. And the temporality of these things is quite 
complex. Since we have a random walk assigned to a normal curve, you essentially both have a sort of amnesic past that you're using its data anyway, but without any historical temporality, while well, you're constantly shorting your bet, right, on the future. Um, this evasion of encounter with the world happens because the credit has already been swapped or the version already rendered obsolete, so that we're always in the next generation mining both of data and minerals before anyone um, can take uh, time to evaluate the implications. If a prototype fails, which is to say found ecologically or economically suboptimal, whatever that might mean since you're only comparing it to yourself, um, uh, or unresilient, then this failure doesn't provide, provoke a wide-scale structural change in approach, the next development's already been planned, but rather a modulation of current strategy and assimilation of the adverse event or any form of resistance into the next model while maintaining the basic operation of the ecology or the system um, uh, within the, the thing. So derivation and resilience are thus married. The subprime mortgage crisis of 2008 might serve as exemplar. From the logic of the derivative, there was no crisis, and in fact, nothing changed. And what is true of finance also often holds today for urban planning and development. Which brings us to our final last few minutes of deriving. So um, the as I said, this concept of resilience is married to a concept of a future that's always a version, perhaps a derivative re replica of another moment. Um, as Melinda Cooper has noted in discussing weather futures, contemporary markets have now produced derivatives. They're literally producing value um, from betting on adverse and unpredictable events in relation to one another rather than as discrete uh, occurrences with lived impacts. So, as she says, where traditional derivative contracts traded the future prices of commodities and financial derivatives trades in Financial derivatives now trade in futures of futures. So you can bet two futures, right, against each other without ever having to find out what those futures, you know, what actually happens. Turning promise itself into a means and ends of accumulation. So kind of consuming the future into um, these highly, often nanosecond uh, trades in the present. Time here becomes not a relationship to the spatial circulation of goods, labor, and commodity, but a thing in itself, a non-historical, but also non-geological or environmental time. It is time as a pure ecology of self-reference. The equation she s implies is somewhat new. She argues that if before, at least since the 19th century, um, and we must recall that derivatives do come out of um, colonialism and the slave trade. And one of the interesting questions in terms of how do we know our infrastructures and our equations is also how do we produce temporalities and times around these um, techne in the present. Um, so uh, derivatives emerge out of the um, Dutch and British East India Company and the slave trades that emerge. But Cooper is arguing that if before um, in, the pre in the previous histories of insurance and derivation industries, value um, now became some sort of value in the future and time equals to money. Now we have like a new equation where um, we, get, we basically get dollars out of raw changes in time. And the speculation no longer is equivalent to prediction. So we have no representation of the final endpoint. We are making bets and extracting and circulating without it. The future is not one that can be predicted. It doesn't rely. It uses past data without necessarily using it to predict um, future action. So financial markets. So um, it does. Uh, so therefore, financial markets hedge bets. Derivatives can be traded to make profits. As I said, long before we know the endpoints of their investments. And in fact, those who repackage and circulate risks as again with mortgage markets, but also now with markets and insurance and weather and just about everything else, are betting on agglomerations of dispersed risks and futures, not on the relationship between the measurable substance or stored value and the commodity and the future price. This provokes new practices most significantly around measurements. So what do we measure when we're looking at these markets since time no longer equals money, rather money drives from time. And as I mentioned, it's speculative, not con the, So this logic assumes physical form through engineering and design and the production of test beds, demos, and prototypes. Speculation on a future that's always multiple and aesthetic. Perhaps that is why the love of animation and re-narration of disaster and all these architectural projects, the constant reminder that change itself is a, m a medium for speculation. If the Cold War was about nuclear testing and simulation as a means to avoid the unthinkable, yet nonetheless quite predictable um, nuclear war 
an end of the world, the formula has now changed. This distinction is best summarized in the distinction um, in, oh look, finally, um, uh, between, <laughs> it showed up, that was supposed to be bouncing the whole time, uh, first laid out in the 1920s by economist Frank Knight, going to Knight, uncertainty, unlike risk, has no clearly defined endpoints or values, offers no clear-cut terminal events. What follows is that the test no longer serves as a simulation of life, but rather makes human life itself um, an experiment for technological futures. This uncertainty embeds itself in our technologies, both of architecture and of finance. Thus, in financial markets, as I said, we swap, drive, and leverage, never fully accounting for risks in the hope that circulation will defer any need to actually represent or confront it. And in infrastructure and engineering, we do exactly the same. Uh, we prototype, develop, and demo, literally at now urban and perhaps planetary scale, in fact, yes, planetary scales, um, whether in building management systems or creating smart infrastructure, which leaves us with a final little equation that I invented, which is resilience is now equal um, changes in actual life, kind of assessed by this demo time. So it makes variation in life itself the source of derivative values that it therefore, that is constantly extracting. This condition and its extreme violence brings us back to the condition in Shilguri. Now all the videos are over um, So as future risks uh, transformed into uncertainty, high technology, and particularly, as I said, smart and ubiquitous computing infrastructures become the language and practice to imagine our future, a future that is becoming increasingly unbearable, which brings me to contemplate the ethical and political implications of a world where derivation, extraction, and resilience are managed are married in a manner that has turned the planet and all its forms of life into a massive medium for the development of smart technologies. So the question is, what other imaginaries or genealogies can we use? How can we interrupt this uh, form? This demands a change of tense in design and politics, but also a real question about what it means to have politics and ethics and aesthetics of uncertainty itself. What does it mean? Um, what forms, how do we negotiate this new epistemology of uncertainty that in fact dominates our financial um, and infrastructural and computational infrastructures? So one thing I've been thinking about a lot, of course, is time itself. How do we create different forms of time, different forms of encounter with the alternative histories that might embed themselves within these algorithms and derivations? I've been thinking about different types of projects that attempt to create different temporalities within spatial um, and urban forms. But I've also been trying to learn from within ecology, how do we actually kind of learn or take about our own systems and how, what kind of um, modes do we have about creating experience around them. So from ecology itself, we learn that resilience actually does not equal optimization. The most optimal system is often the least resilient, it can't modify itself. But I've also been thinking with people like Annette Singh about, and her woods and mushrooms about like what it means to have care and different forms of cultivating ecology and life. Um, but also I've been thinking about uncertainty. Uncertainty is a weapon, or weapon, tactic for many sides. So today, for example, environmentalists working against things like the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline in Canada are trying to um, change um, credit ratings and, um, and uh, risk evaluations on pipelines or change Canadian bond rating as a mode of also intervening or stopping uh, projects. There's a question also of how one both reveals uncert the uncertainties that are part of life um, as well as hiding, of course, your own data from the, all these corporations that exist. And there's many other things I could talk. So I'm going to end there about thinking about we, how we can think about different forms of temporality and different forms of experimentation that are not merely those of demos and derivation. So I'll end there. Thanks.
Okay. Um, I'll wait till people finish okay. <laughs> <laughs> responding amongst themselves. Yeah. Okay, so we, um, uh, we should get going. We're um, uh, a little over time, but we still have 10 or 15 minutes for, um, for a discussion. And, um, um, but I did, you know, I sort of framed a, um, a couple of um, somewhat broader questions to, um, uh, to pose. And, and um, given the time constraints, I might actually put them both on the table um, and you can... Um, choose to respond to one or the other. And in a way, actually, um, uh, a writ ended on a, a question that I did want to pose, and um, so we can maybe um, work around that. But first, in a way, a uh, um, uh, question of methodology. Uh, one that's really motivated by the, the issue of how information technologies or their effects uh, touch down uh, differently or, or unevenly I in the world, you know, geographically, materially, et cetera. And so, um, you know, Anita's um, paper had a um, sort of case study or focus, you yeah, know, through the laboratoria in mm -hmm. Peru. Um, and uh, uh, the paper and the way in which the, the buses came in to, you know, interrupt the, the type of imaginary of the uh, organizers of that, of that startup to, 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 um, uh, to, you know, test its sort of limits, or market's limits, but also its cynicisms. And um, or it's people also, you know, touched down in a series of examples, Songdo, um, and in Calcutta, um, albeit in a somewhat different way. And, and your paper, in a way, worked in a very different register, you know, tracing sort of thematics um, uh, across a much broader historical and geographical framework, you know, in trying to, to identify a set of... Uh, of issues. So I just wanted to um, ask firstly, um, should you wish to, uh, if you wanted to talk a bit about you know, how you think this relationship between the, the broader claims of the paper and the types of evidence or, or archives um, that you draw from in order to, to, to make those arguments or you know, what you're uh, thinking about in terms of what the case studies do, um, how they uh, uh, either propel or also at times might you know trouble your own arguments. I'm just trying to get you to sort of un unpack a little bit um, um, uh, of, of of that relationship, and and I'm doing so you know to ask certainly how arguments migrate from one place to another, or or they don't, or you know what are the um, uh, sort of limit conditions of that type of work, or or how do we understand at times a, a somewhat paradoxical relations between the tendencies of communication technologies to draw disparate elements and places together, and we saw that in many of the presentations. Yeah, this is a sort of key ideology um, of, of communication technologies, that they bring people together. Yeah? Um, and uh, yeah, this refrains a free flow of information, global villages, connectivity, even of access, access to tools. So I'm wondering you know, how we think the relationship um, but between these, um, uh, these types of ideologies and the very particular ways they touch down, as I mentioned, in different cultures, in different economic contexts, or otherwise sort of encounter the complexities of the world. Like, what does that do? Or how do you uh, attend to engage, refuse that? Uh, so it's a history theory question to some degree. Um, and the other, the other thing I wanted to table goes something like this. It's a, um, a, a question about how to think the political tendencies or political ambivalences of the technologies uh, at w work in the paper, and, and again, their impact upon things urban, including subjects. Um, and, and it is a, I mean, we could see it as a way of asking a sort of older question about technological determinism or causality and you know, how to, to read these relations. But um, so uh, I guess my question would go this way, you know, how I'm just asking you to unpack um, some of the ambivalences or potential instabilities at play, just to, to desublimate or foreground these parts of your papers. Um, and, uh, you know, coming from your um, uh, abstract, you need to, you know, you, you spoke to the question of um, uh, dissimulation, of amplifying and selecting, and of course these uh, work very differently depending on who is doing the dissimulation or amplifying or selecting, or, or do they not? I mean, I guess that's uh, one of the struggles that the um, laboratory of 
brings up, yeah? Who is selecting, who is actually selecting is these women who are coding? What type of agency do they have uh, in this framework? Or um, uh, in Arit's case, there's lots of different ambivalences, but certainly uh, one of them would be something like, um, you know, how do you think this very um, cynical um, mobilization of, of fear about these so-called crises and our need to actually a attend to them. Yeah? And you, again, you began to uh, address that towards the very end, um, 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 complicated, of course, by the, the trope of the futurity itself opening onto the unknown and the ways in which Hollings uh, complicated that. But I, 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 um, um, I, I guess in, in your case, you know, one thing that really struck me um, is um, how you how you engage with architecture as a field, a field which um, almost, you know, almost uh, on the sort of ontological um, uh, uh, level asks about futures, yeah? Mm -hmm. About better futures often, but, um, you know, the very act of architecture is to make a project, to project forward, to think in the future, uh, regardless of our ability to know that. So, so when you ask the question of a discipline that's always <laughs> always thinking into these unknowable futures. How does that, you know, complicate your argument, or does it not? Um, so, so again, just a question about how, um, uh, to what degree the power relations at play, or even some of the semantic aspects that your papers addressed, you know, reversible in the sense of the apparatus at play, allowing for different types of shifting or switching, and, you know, as we know, one reason that it becomes in uh, and Shannon and I have this little note here about the democracy or dictatorship that you alluded to in the, um, uh, in the midst of thinking about radio's use, and so I think this would be one of the key tropes. But uh, you know, one reason, of course, it becomes important to identify these types of ambivalences at, at, um, at, at work or embedded within in technologies is that they suggest that they can be put to work or function differently, um, yeah, that we should also be asking what else can these technologies do? Yeah? Can they produce a, a type of counter strategy or, or you know, be made to work against their intended function? And, and so in, in Art's case also I would say, um, you, know, you might ask the question not of how do you produce a different, um, a different temporality, uh, but how do you occupy the temporality of finance capital? Uh, you know, how do you think that embedded there or inherent to that is um, uh, uh, the, the answer to how one would um, uh, yeah, update political strategies? Yeah? So it would not be the strike or the refusal, it would be the recoding. Or, so yeah, I'm just, uh, I would you know, ask you to, to, to think about uh, the ambivalent position that you know you're you're put in vis a vis these these types of cynicisms and, and operations. So anyway, two questions: one about historical method, how things touch down, um, uh, you know, how you use case studies in regard to the larger questions, but the other, um, uh, what yeah, you know, what, what's at stake? What's motivating the the recognition of um, of ambivalences at, at work in? in the, the case studies you're looking at, what, what's the uh, ambition um, sort of underlying your, your yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah? Okay. So we can start anywhere, whoever. I think I can uh, maybe okay. tackle those briefly, I yeah. hope, because we don't have much time. No, and I'm wanna, maybe want to open up to you as well. But yeah. um, I think even though archaeology is looking at the deep past or even the recent past, it's still very much about futures because a lot, it's a nationalist enterprise in many cases where countries will marshal archaeology to essentially establish a tradition that you will then create your future in line with. Mm -hmm. And particularly, it's not also divorced from or irrelevant to contemporary technologies because mm -hmm. it's particularly if you look at digital archaeology, archaeology, um, the use of kind of routers and 3D printers, et cetera, kind of marshalling crowdsourced data, sending people with cell phones into conflict zones to kind of three, to capture all sides of an at-risk monument, for instance, and then using 3D printers to recreate it, as was the case with the Palmyra March, that, uh, sorry, Palmyra Arch, which you might know traveled the world, stopped at the Venice Architecture Biennale as kind of a piece of mass mediated kind of spectacle itself. So I think that uh, the deep past is very much integrated with futures, shaping futures. And in regard to the, archi the archive of archaeology, I guess you could say, I think it's really related to the issues of risk and sustainability that Arit talked about, because you look at the unevenness of the record, the archaeological and the archival record. One of the reasons that it is that certain uh, regions of the world have a kind of um, 
a impoverished record is because they are in sites of res risk and resilience, coastal zones, for instance, places of conflict, places of looting, for instance. So the ability to kind of marshal the archaeological record to project a future is impoverished in those cases. And I think this is maybe where speculation is also integrated, um, because I'm looking at the types of things that don't readily lend themselves to re-piecing or recreation through clearly defined archaeological artifacts, particularly mm -hmm. if you're thinking about how sensory history happens Happened. You can't look at a photograph, or you can't look at a, it's a, it is involved speculation. There's speculative method in looking at kind of the dimensions, the materiality of a space, and imagining how smell and taste and sound would have reverberated in those places, which are very much a part of how politics is enacted. So I think that speculation and time and even the deep past are all kind of integrated into the archaeological space itself. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, on eth an ethnography, an ethnographic <laughs> method. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's clearly to kind of re bring back in the human element, the human voice. Mm -hmm. So many of our accounts of how big data works and the kind of politics and operations of big data are ones, are forms of accounting that eviscerate any kind of human agency and a kind of narration of human presence and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to get to the kind of ethics of care that I think uh, some of the work of people in this room and then also Reed and Shannon are gesturing towards, um, it really does require a kind of re-emphasis re and a kind of focus back on the way human actors are behind, mm -hmm. <laughs> are making key decisions, um, and are just sort of subject to this kind of windfall of, you know, this changing, uh, constantly mutating ecology and just responsive as opposed purely to assimilated actually, sense, exactly, yeah. Yeah. which also gets mm -hmm. to this kind of second question of how it matters who's behind the filtering. Um, and for sure, I mean, for a site like Labrador Authority, how do you get outside of this kind of thick, thick filter bubble mm -hmm. that Silicon Valleyites are, are creating around themselves in collaboration with a whole other network ecology? I mean, Labrador is not exactly Silicon Valley, and mm -hmm. yet it echoes and reperforms and then reinstantiates that within a particular kind of site, right, as a heroic narrative, one that gets replicated and reinstantiated over and over again because it looks so deeply appealing. Um, mm -hmm. But it matters, obviously, right? That it's that kind of that's them doing the filtering. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, when Mark Zuckerberg is, is like, "We are right," mm -hmm. the kind of best global community. Um, it's not. It's not unlike the way Laboratoria is performing in its ceremonies and the way it organizes its um, its hackathons. This way of con con of continuously looking inward and refusing to look outward, such that like even the most basic matter of fact things, how everyone else is moving around the city, you know, like can get ignored. And it really is, I mean, like, I don't think, you know, the laboratory kids are, um, are they're not stupid. I mean, they are really, they are clearly, um, you know, hi hyperactive, they don't sleep, <laughs> um, super dynamic, um, managing, you know, reams and reams of different kinds of ecologies and different networks of actors. But of course, in order to do that, they have to kind of create these sorts of ignorance um, kinds of swaps, you know, space, site mm -hmm. spaces and mm -hmm. sites because it can't possibly be held responsible and accountable for the thing that is right in front of them. They can't actually enact the real politics of care that they promised to do. Um, so how do we get outside of that? We can. I mean, so, uh, mm -hmm. and I'll just a very quick note is, I mean, even within the site of Laboratoria themselves, part of the reason why it works is not because of data-driven responsiveness from the company itself. I mean, when you watch the kind of enactment of how it is that a classroom of 50 girls who are from backgrounds where a, co a CS 101 class would never look like that, not at my university, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the kinds of dynamics of, um, of of, of care, of collaboration that they create amongst themselves, whether it's even just bringing in snacks, mm. selling lunch to each other for something like, you know, three soles, two soles, which is like 60 cents, which makes it so much, much more affordable than what you would normally get for lunch, you know, in the mm. Middle Florida's district. I mean, those are the kinds of, bringing in blankets and like pillows for each other, braiding each other's hair. I mean, it's that kind of thing that creates a different kind mm. of politic of affinity um, that is part of the under-narrated and de-visibilized um, kind of functioning of that space. It's not because of the data-driven ecologies. Yeah. Robert, you have one uh, minute. <laughs> <laughs> I think I spoke enough. Um, you can ask me later. I, I understood uh, one really interesting, uh, two things really uh, interested me about your question, which is one, I think, in a lot of ways, you're getting a, a kind of critical question around scale. 
Uh, around scale, oh sorry, around scale, but how we're kind of negotiating different scales of mm. phenomena, both temporally and spatially, and where we can use those with or f together in some sort of diverse way um, to do things. And then the other thing, like for me, I would say, like I'm actually really obsessed with this question of, 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 of what it means to experiment or what, like alternative forms of speculative practice, um, which really prompts me to say like, well, we should have that conversation about architecture and like what forms of futurity are being engendered and how closely or non-closely they marry onto the forms of financial, um, mm -hmm. financialization and, and, and other and technical infrastructures. Um, so all I'm saying, all I, for me, a lot of these case studies are, are a lot about more like the like instruments or tools. I'm a really um, shoddy ethnographer, and they're actually um, totally probably <laughs> irresponsible. And and that's a real question about infrastructural fetishism and like um, porn. When you go to all these, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure porn, <laughs> and, it, I'm, and I'm laughing about it, but it's also like a serious ethical and moral question that we have to take up in terms of our own work, and in general, the structure of the research studio, which is always kind of crashing into some site pretty fast and doing something. Um, so, uh, so that's what I'm going to say is that I'm kind of interested in that, and I use these a lot of times as drivers to be producing these um, equations or relations that help me put together like histories of ecology and environmentalism and cybernetics with, um, with histories of financialization or econ like that these allow me to, to draw together these, these, these disparate worlds of architectural and design practice, um, technical infrastructures and other histories of habitat and environment mm -hmm. okay. that okay. kind of just work like that. I've actually been given clearance to um, take one question from the audience. Uh, <laughs> so get your hands up quickly. Okay, is that Paul? Oh. Hi, I'm uh, Brennan O'Rear. I was involved in uh, some uh, smart city design in India in 2014, 2015, and one thing I noticed about panels and around the table in those discussions is oftentimes, uh, I'd, I'd say almost always, everyone was presenting as male. And here, well. everyone well. at this Presenting panel, as what? I'm sorry. Ma male, oh. right? And and here I see the reverse. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether and how gender might inflect the disparities you see between smart city conference, perhaps an anti-smart city conference. <laughs> <laughs> Mega production and reproduction, closely married. <laughs> I have to intervene. Laura's stepping in here. There's going to be plenty of men. So, um, I'm going to have to queer the place. <laughs> if anyone doesn't, if no one wants to, um, uh, R reply, we can go get coffee. Um, or <laughs> okay, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you to the speakers, just to underscore. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.